Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 9 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. I had such a great discussion with Dr. Justin Yop of the University of North Carolina for this episode. Justin is a clinical psychologist and is co-author of the book, The Group, Seven Widowed Fathers Reimagine Life. I really enjoyed our wide-ranging discussion. It was a fascinating mix of practical and academic, and included some great stories from the widowed dads in the book about their experiences. Some of the topics we covered include the dual process model of coping and bereavement, post-traumatic growth, the concept of being a good enough parent, the unique hardships of being a widowed father, and the research into the needs of widowed parents that's being conducted right now at UNC. And by the way, if you're a widowed mom or dad with kids 18 and under at home uh, and widowed less than three years, I'd encourage you to answer the survey on their website. This is such important work, and surprisingly, there's very little research that's been done on the needs of widowed parents. Look for the link in the show notes for Episode 9. I hope you enjoy my discussion with Dr. Justin Yap. My guest today is Dr. Justin Yap, a clinical psychologist at the Lineberger Cancer Center at the University of North Carolina and co-author of the book, The Group, Seven Widowed Fathers Reimagine Life. He is joining us from his office in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Justin, welcome. Thank you, Harper. I really appreciate you having me on today. So I'd like to ask you to start, if you would, please, by reading this passage from your book. And it's from the start of Chapter 5. And... This chapter is called The Wrong Parent Died. Sure, I'd be happy to. Let me get it out here. Okay. Um, So, yeah, as you mentioned, this is chapter five from our book, and uh, I'll read the first uh, page or so now. Absolutely, 100%, Neil answered without hesitation. Carl repeated his question. You really believe that your children would be better off if you died instead of your wife? It's not even close, Neil said. He quickly counted off all the things that Deanna had done for their family, detailing her involvement in just about every aspect of their children's lives. She was simply a much more important cog in the family wheel. You guys helped me out with my daughter in the hockey game situation, but Deanna would have handled it on her own, Neil concluded. So yeah, for my children's sake, there's no question that the wrong parent died. The discussion leading up to that exchange between Neil and Carl had coalesced around the familiar topic of parental competence, or as the men often saw it, parental incompetence. Carl had shared his latest blunder, which occurred when he took his two children on a family trip to Connecticut for a wedding. As they were leaving their hotel room for the ceremony, Carl noticed for the first time how his children were dressed. So, there's my 10-year-old son wearing a pair of khakis that don't even come close to fitting him. The pant legs stopped about three inches above his ankles, and he couldn't even button the pants because the waistband was so tight. He looked ridiculous, but they were the only pair of pants I had brought for him to wear. Yet another instance of being unprepared for something, which is something that Carl hated. So I'm standing there looking at my son in the hallway of this hotel, and I think to myself, no way this happens if Susan were still here. I know just what you mean, Neil said. Deanna did so many things better than I'm doing them right now. I feel like I'm screwing up pretty much all the time. Then he said the words that caught Carl by surprise. The wrong parent died. Neil had never been comfortable opening up about his feelings. He had joined our support group only for his children's sake. If they were going to be stuck with the wrong parent, he figured he owed it to them to be the best wrong parent he could be. He thought that being with other, with other single brief fathers might help him. Thank you for sharing that. I, that part about jumped out at me. The um, If he was going to be the wrong parent, he may as well be the best wrong parent that he could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, um, you know, that was certainly something that, that we see from a lot of the parents in our support group and that we saw from the seven guys who wrote about in this book is that um, just this sense that there's there's no way for one parent to to be there in the same way that two parents were. But for these men, at least, we really had from a lot of them kind of this sense, and they, they voiced it, that not only could they not do, you know, could they not make up for their wives' absence, of course, but that they were, that the wrong parent had died and that their 
their wives were more uh, were more important or more crucial or more needed by their children than even they were as fathers. Mm. So it wasn't just that their kids had lost a parent, um, but they had lost a more important parent. Interesting. Um, yeah, and that, and that wasn't a view shared by all the men. Certainly everyone had their own viewpoint, but it was shared, as you heard there, by Neil and um, by some other ones too. And that um, I think that kind of contributed to their feeling of um, – my kids uh, worry, anxiety about screwing their kids up because they couldn't be a good enough parent. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, I had figured and and had certainly known and realized that their children had already been through so much and kind of this palpable anxiety that uh, not only have they already been through, you know, a really traumatic loss, but now they've got me as the parent and I'm going to screw things up moving forward. Yeah. Um, That was a not infrequent topic of discussion um, in our support groups. Yeah. Um, and then you heard there in that little exchange where Carl kind of pushed back on that. Um, and it gets in further in that chapter where that's not really how Carl looked at it. Um, but it was for a little while, but he had kind of, um, kind of outgrown that and figured that he was just giving himself a pity party at that point, that really what his children needed wasn't their mom or their dad. What they needed was both parents Mm. And no one's fault, um, that wasn't the case anymore. And it wasn't, it wasn't his fault that his kids didn't have what they needed, and it was up to him to do the best he could. Mm-hmm. So I want to dive more deeply into so many things you just said. Um, first, though, I think we should just back up a little bit and just if you could tell listeners um, a little bit about how you got involved in working with widowed parents in the first place. Sure. So, uh, yeah, so I'm part of a, uh, a, a team here of psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers here at the UNC Cancer Hospital. And so what my day job is, in a sense, is to work with uh, patients who have cancer in their families. And it so happened that about eight or nine years ago now, um, our group, uh, different ones of us were working with uh, young parents. It happened to be young mothers with terminal cancer. And uh, it just happened that three mothers died around the same time. And during one of our weekly meetings, we were talking about it. And one of my colleagues said, you know, we ought to just refer these, you know, these fathers to a support group. We had come to know them a little bit. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look for one. I'll, I'll send them the, uh, the information for our local support group. Very naively thinking that such a group even existed uh, in our area, really anywhere. Uh-huh. And so once we looked around and realized that there were, there wasn't really any such thing as a support group for widowed parents. Uh, my colleague and co-author Don Rosenstein, we we decided, you know what? Why don't we call those few dads who we knew and see if we could get a few more and kind of put together a support group? And so we did. And um, <laughs> talk, talk about uh, being naive. We we thought <laughs> that we knew what we were doing at first. Of course, we mm-hmm. did. Um, and we thought that the support group would last for six sessions, mm-hmm. and that half of that. Half of that time would be spent each night. Half of that time would be with Don and I kind of imparting our wisdom, or so we thought. (laughs) And half the time for group discussion. And that first night that the guys met, we were so blown away and so moved by uh, how they clearly bonded and connected with each other. Um, After some initial awkwardness, um, first meeting awkwardness, but how they bonded with each other and clearly what they had to say to each other was more important than what we had to say to them. And so we proposed that maybe we kind of scrap the plan for this kind of half didactic and just make a group discussion. And the guys thought that was great. And one of the fathers said, well, if this happens to work, why would you limit it to six sessions? Hmm. Great question. We didn't have a good answer. So we said, well, let's just keep it open and, and we'll kind of experiment and see how it goes. And then those seven guys met together for just about four years. Um, and it's their story that we, that we chronicle in the book. Four years. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and during that time, they really was, I mean, they were there for each other. They were there for themselves. They were doing it for their kids, but they really helped Don and I um, really educated us uh, to the point where we could write this book and support and uh, begin our program for widowed parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it really came a lot about, became a lot about these guys giving back by helping us learn about what widowed parents go through so that we could, develop programs and do research and kind of, uh, and kind of expand our efforts. Mm-hmm. So what do you think then are some of the unique 
hardships of being a widowed father as opposed to, say, a widowed mother or a single parent by some other means? Well, we had, you know, single parent by other means. We, we, we've heard from more than, more than a few dads that, um, you know, they have friends maybe who are single parents due to divorce. Mm. Um, and that sometimes their friends will try and, you know, kind of say, ah, I know what you're going through, you know, it's tough. And uh, that journey doesn't land that well because it's, you know, being a, being a single parent in, in that way is, is a lot different than being a, a widowed parent where there's no other parent for the weekend to hand off. There's no other parent to bounce decision making off of. Um, you're kind of it. And so there's some similarities, but our, our you know, we've heard some guys uh, kind of bristle at the prospect that being a single parent in that sense is, is the same as being a widowed parent. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as men and, and women, that's a, that's actually an open question, kind of how are widowed fathers and widowed mothers different from each other? And it's, we're currently doing some research that we hope can shed some light on that. But, um, you know, certainly culturally, there are expectations of what men do and what women do. And that may or may not apply to an individual. Um, but I, I think one thing we've heard from our guys is that they seem to get a lot of pity from people. Mm -hmm. Um that people kind of look at them and, and think, you know, oh, gosh, this guy's really up a creek. <laughs> or, you know, this um, this poor guy doesn't know how to cook a meal or grocery shop or figure out how to, you know, sign all the permission slips for field trips and all the things that go uh, with being a parent. And for some of that, that's just kind of, you know, maybe gender-based stereotype, but for some of that, it's definitely true. Um, and then as far as coming together for a support group, it's, you know, it's it's harder for most men to do that, I think, than it is for women. And um, we started a support group, two colleagues of our did, for, colleagues of our did for uh, widowed mothers several months ago. And so we have that up and going now. And they've already had the problem of um, having maybe too many people in the group and too many people huh. want to sign up. Wow. We've been doing the fathers group for eight years. We've never had that problem. <laughs> um, it's just harder to get guys to engage. And the first night we met with these seven men in the book, you know, a, a unifying theme for all the guys was to make clear, you know, that they, they weren't support group kind of guys. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't where they saw themselves in any way, was sitting around talking about thoughts and feelings and shortcomings. Um, that, that's a little harder, I think, for, for more men than it is for women. Mm. Uh, so I think that's just a couple of differences that uh, speak to your question. So given that, that last challenge that you mentioned, what, uh, like, how can you interest them in this what do you what did you find well i think that's a great question and i think what um one thing that i, I some of the guys have said made it or kind of inferred that made it easier to join was uh the idea that they're doing it for their kids mm -hmm. um, right kind of like like uh, like uh, neil mentioned you know if i'm going to be the if the wrong parent died and i'm and i'm the wrong parent to be the one raising my children, I might as well be the best one I can be. So <laughs> I'll join the support group and if I can figure out a few things and make it better for my kid, then I'll make it a little less bad. So kind of the, the idea of joining for and participating for your kid's sake. Mm -hmm. Made it a little more accessible or a little Made more... A, a little more accessible, a little more I'm kind of coming for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of come for the kids, but stay for yourself. Right, right. <laughs> um, okay. I, what do you think... Um, what do you think surprised the dads as they went? I mean, it's four years of this. Do you think there were any things that surprised them along the way? Oh, uh, countless. Yeah, I think yeah. The, the the whole thing was a surprise, right? They that they were even in a position to need or to be eligible mm -hmm. for the support group, and then sure. to participate in one and to be a member of one for um, nearly four years. Yeah, I'd, I mean, it's. I think each each father learned about himself in ways that um, they probably never would have if it had not been for what they went through. And that's actually one of the things that, uh, that didn't come, didn't really kind of come online for a while with the group was, was kind of noting that there are some benefits or that there are some growth involved in trauma. Mm. And that, does not mean at all that it's worth it or that it's a good thing that this happened. Um, 
one of the guys in our group I'm thinking of just right now, his name's Bruce. Uh, he's in the book. Um, you know, he, he talks about how he felt like he was a better father, not right away. Um, but after a couple of few years, he felt like he was more in touch with his three daughters than he was before. He was more involved because uh, he had to be. Um, he kind of had a, a better sense of everything going on with the family because he was the only one that could. He felt closer to his kids. Um, and he was thankful for that, right? I mean, he's, he's appreciative of that and felt that he had grown as a person and a father. But for the longest time, he didn't want to say that out loud. Hmm. because, And not just to the group, but to friends or family, or whatever, because it almost, or he worried that it would sound like, um, you know, this is a good thing, my wife died. This, is, this, is, this has really been okay, and it's not okay. It's awful, and it's terrible, and it's tragic. And there are some areas of growth. And I think that was a real surprise to the guys that, um, you know, when you think of all the, all the, the horribleness that goes along with this, that there can also be some, some rays of, of, of sunlight and that they could connect with others that in a way they never would have thought possible. They could grow as people, grow as fathers in a way they never felt they would um, needed to, or never even realized they needed to. Um, yeah. I think, I think all that, all that was surprising to them. It, so it sounds like you're talking about this concept of post-traumatic growth. That's right. Um, yeah. Can you just, for the listeners, what just explain what is post-traumatic growth? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners have heard of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. That's kind of a, you know, it's a diagnosable, um, uh, you know, mental illness, and it's, um, you know, not that uncommon. And so post-traumatic growth is a, a little bit of the opposite of that. And so it's post-traumatic, so after a trauma, um, not only do you have all the stress that comes with it that may qualify for a PTSD diagnosis, but that there are some areas of growth and that you may have a different, more mature, more enhanced perspective on life, a different appreciation for things that you used to take for granted before, um, having to step up with new roles or responsibilities as a result of the trauma um, and growing from those. And it's, it's a couple of things. Post-traumatic growth can occur regardless of whether you have post-traumatic stress or not. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. They're not the different sides of the same continuum. You can mm. have PTSD and grow. Both of those right. things are possible at the same time, or you can have either or neither. Mm. Um, but the idea that, that trauma happens and then we change from that, and we normally think of those changes as being negative. Um, but they don't all have to be negative, and each of our guys – uh, could could identify and recognize ways in which they had grown, um, but not right away. <laughs> That's I think the post traumatic growth phenomenon takes a little time to to kind of come online and to really appreciate, and then maybe longer to acknowledge uh, for mm-hmm. fear of um, kind of making it sound Pollyannish or that that somehow this is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that both things are true. It it was. It's horrible. It remains horrible. And I've grown from it. And I know there's no, you know, you can't put a timeline around that, but I'm assuming you're not talking like days and weeks and months. You're talking more like years maybe down the road. I I think that's when, certainly that's when the guys in our group saw it. Um, Yeah. I think it's more once you've absorbed the hit, once you've stumbled and fallen and gotten back up and stumbled and fallen again and gotten back up and, and really kind of, have a little bit of space from the immediate impact of your loss Mm -hmm. and have enough time and kind of, um, you know, in a, in a good mental space to reflect on the last year or however long, two years, three years. And you can look back and kind of see how, you know, remember how you were before the loss and see how you are now. And doubtlessly you can see lots of ways in which life is harder. And I think most people upon reflection can see, ways in which in which they've grown Mm -hmm. so yeah it's certainly not something um you know and we had and we we hear from parents a lot where um and i imagine you experience this where friends and family who try to be helpful um so sometimes say comments that don't come across as helpful like um you know you're young enough to remarry again or or kind of things like that um so i think post-traumatic growth is something that you have to realize internally, not something that can be told to you by someone else who's not in your situation because it comes across mm-hmm. as 
you, know, you don't know what I'm you don't know what I'm dealing with. Uh huh. Uh, and that's actually the power of the group in that they could suggest you know things to each other and it you know, resonated differently and and more impactfully because they were hearing from other people who had walked similar paths. Mm-hmm. Uh, much more than if Don or I said something in the group meeting. I mean, certainly we had our place, but um, you know, neither Don nor I are, are widowed parents. Um, so hearing from each other um, carries a, a certain a, a, a certain weight to it. Mm-hmm. Um, hearing from you know Uncle Bill or Aunt Sally just doesn't carry. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I was pleased to um, you know following the stories of the guys in the book to see that. Neil, who mm-hmm. you had, we started out uh, our talk, you read the passage about the wrong parent died. I think he came back and said later that he actually felt he had grown closer to his kids. He did, yeah. That's kind of, I think, toward the end or maybe right at the end of the book where he, it took him a little while, but he realized um, that and could appreciate how he had grown and how he had grown closer to his kids. And actually, the book opens with a, a, a scene with him and his, I think, 15, 16 year old daughter in which Neil had a way that they wanted to, that he wanted the family to honor the first anniversary of his wife and their mom's death. And he had it all planned out. And when he told his 16 year old, 15 year old daughter, what the plan was, that wasn't her plan. <laughs> and he wanted to do something different. And she wanted to go to a hockey game with her friends that night. And he said, no, we're doing this. And she said, no, I'm doing this. And it led to this kind of two days when neither one of them talked to each other. And in that time, Neil came to the group and, threw himself at the mercy of the other guys and said, I'm, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. Um, and got some, I think, really helpful advice from from his peers. And so that's kind of the the beginning. And then he, for a long time, felt like the wrong parent died, that Deanna, his wife, would have handled the situation with much more tact than, than he did. But then three or four years later, he had a similar situation um, around, the, I think it was the fourth year anniversary of his wife's death. Um, where things didn't quite go as planned, but he handled it. He figured it out on his own, and his kids appreciated it. And, it, you know, we, we were writing the book. We didn't want to end the book on some kind of, um, you know, happily ever after kind of, uh, you know, ending that wouldn't ring true because, you know, there's no kind of end to the grief completely. Mm-hmm. It's not like you know, everyone, you know, lived happily ever after and, and it was sunshine and rainbows, but... We really wanted to capture the, the, the growth and the healing um, that each of the men made individually and then certainly how they help each other do it as a group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's great. If well, I can mention one thing, and because I, I, yeah. I sometimes fail to mention this, is that uh, as far as the book, any, any proceeds or all the proceeds that we get from the book go straight back to our uh, widowed parent program. So Don and I aren't uh, making any of the money we've, I also figured out I don't know how any authors make any career off this because you don't get a whole lot with the royalties. But whatever royalties we've gotten so far, we just put straight back into the program. Um, it was kind of, you know, we didn't want to be seen and didn't want to make uh, a profit off these seven men story. And they were open enough to, you know, have a share their story mm-hmm. and use their real names and their real, you know, kind of real life um, experiences and, um, you know, we weren't going to make money off that. Just so anyone thinks that, you know, the, the money goes, which isn't a whole lot, but the money uh, goes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, something that you talked about somewhere, I, I don't know where I read this, but um, there's a something that you called the dual process model of mm-hmm. coping and bereavement. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and, and also sure. how, you know, understanding that idea might help a, a widowed parent think about their own situation. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of, or not a lot, but there's a number of um, models of looking at grief. And I think the most, the one that most people are familiar with is the five stages of grief. Uh, mm-hmm. with Eva Ross and, you know, kind of the, uh, the depression, the anger, the denial and the acceptance. Um, and as it turns out, that that model, which I think, was very helpful in kind of getting the ball rolling and people talking about bereavement back in the sixties um, really doesn't, there's been no research to support it. And it really doesn't match. I think a lot of people's, most people's experiences because grief is more than just five emotions and grief is, is more than some kind of linear, you know, kind of doing one thing after another. That's, 
that at least in my opinion, really fails to capture the complexity and the individualistic nature of grief. Mm -hmm. And so we had one of the guys, Carl, in our group who disclosed that he, you know, he was kind of going with the five stages of grief model at first and was trying to fit his experiences in with that model. And it, you know, he thought, I thought I was past this stage or am I in this stage and was really trying to square his experiences with the model he felt that it needed to fit mm. and that really wasn't helpful for him especially because we don't think that model is really how it works so the dual process uh the dual process model of coping uh, with bereavement is a model that was created by uh, strobe and shoot two researchers from the netherlands about 20 years ago and what we like well i'll explain it briefly it goes into more detail in the book of course but it really looks at two categories of stressors that people deal with and are faced to, you know, have to cope with following a loss. And those are um, loss oriented stressors and restoration oriented stressors. And as it sounds like the loss oriented stressors are, um, you know, what you would typically think of as grief, right? I've lost a relationship. I've lost the mother of my children. I've lost the sense of security that we all live to be 80. Um, things that are lost that are no more that you look back on and grieve. Okay. The other bucket is restoration oriented stressors. And these are ones that are, are issues that need coping with moving forward. Not just the ones looking back, but as a widowed parent, I've got to, I've, I've got to, you know, be available to talk to my kids about their grief. I got to figure out whether or not they need to see a counselor. I got to figure out how to honor Christmas or Hanukkah this year uh, without my wife or my husband. Um, I need to, I need to make lunches for school the next day. I got to pay the bills. I got all these things that are different now and more stressful because of the loss. Mm -hmm. And so there's the backward looking stressors and the forward moving stressors. And what Strobe and Shoot propose, and we see this all the time and hearing from the guys, is that you move back and forth between each, and that's called the oscillation. So you, and it can happen over days and it can happen within minutes, right? So you may be, um, you know, take, having to rush out the door and get your kids to school on time, and that's a stressor because you don't have your wife there to help out and you're having to do everything, and that's a stressor. And then you're driving to work because you got to keep your job, but on the way there, you hear a song that reminds you of your wife. And that takes you back to when, you know, you're, when you were you know, dating or what, whatever the memory is. But then you have to, you know, move forward with work. You still got to keep the job and keep the money coming in. But then that night your kid is tearful and you don't know if it's about losing mom or because he had a bad day at school. Mm -hmm. So kind of this oscillation back and forth, which at the beginning can feel like a, just a, a whipsaw of going uh -huh. back and forward and you kind of can't even make sense of it all uh -huh. Over time that tends to kind of calm down and the looking back still happens maybe a little bit less and maybe with you know a little bit uh, not quite as raw of an emotional reaction and the moving forward gets to be a little less stressful because you get more used to it you get more accustomed to it and so what felt like kind of this starts to kind of do a little more like this and that's indicative of what we would call, you know, healthy or adaptive coping. Um, but that doesn't mean that on the anniversary or just on a random date for a reason you can't figure out, you just get whipsawed back into that and you have just a day where you just want to stay in bed all day. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that kind of way of looking at it where, so that whole, that whole dual process model is just a way to kind of categorize and understand your experiences what we like about the model is it doesn't tell you what experiences you need to have. It doesn't tell you you should be angry or depressed or that it's time for acceptance or that you're in denial. It, it can be any of those things. It can be all those things and it can be a million more things. So it, it's not prescriptive in that way that it tells you how you feel and what you task you need to do to get back. It's a way to kind of categorize a kind of a, a taxonomy of how, your experiences and just understand that once we kind of, you know, discovered this ourselves and talked about it with the guys in the group, it really resonated with all of them because it's, um, you know, you can kind of get this model and, and fit it to your own experiences and it's almost always going to make sense. Mm -hmm. And 
I think just for a lot of the guys having that that structure to understand their experiences and thinking, okay, I'm I'm doing this now, or okay, I can see why I'm moving forward, or it's been one of these days. At least understanding and kind of having a context for your experiences um, can help lower the temperature on the emotional reactivity to it. And so. Uh... Does that taxonomy have any yardsticks? Like, you know, in the beginning, maybe you're going to spend 75% of your time in the backward looking, you know, and, but, and over time you should expect less and less and moving towards the forward looking or how do you. In general, yes. Nothing like the kind of 75% or kind of after X amount of months or X amount of years, but in general, healthy coping, healthy, you know, adaptive coping is reflected by, you know, kind of lowering, you know, not quite as, not quite as whipsaw and a little more toward the moving forward and the restorative stressors and a little bit less looking back or when you do look back, it doesn't floor you as easily as it used to. Mm -hmm. A kind of a reduction in the intensity, a reduction in the kind of back and forth nature of it and a little more leaning toward restorative. Okay. Um, You want to see a trend line over time kind of. Yeah. But, you know, and it's, and, you know, the, the, the fathers in our group have really helped us understand that being a widowed parent, you know, you have those, you have right off the bat, right? First day, you are having to, you know, figure out how your children are grieving and talk to them about their mother or their father's death. While at the same time, you know, you have to plan a funeral, or you have to make sure that, um, you know, that the kids still eat dinner and that the kids still get fed. And, this, you know, you, you have all the, all the responsibilities of being the only parent on the very, on day one. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's. So we had a little technical glitch here uh, in Seattle. I lost power for a second, but we are back with Justin. Um, so I'm very glad we were able to get him back here. Um, I wanted to ask you, Justin, in, in the book, you talked about uh, this concept of the good enough parent. And I'm wondering what, first of all, what is that? And secondly, why do you think that's important? So the concept of the good enough parent was uh, first introduced by Donald Winnicott back in, the, I believe, the 1950s. Um, it was actually called the good enough mother then. Um, and it was kind of, you know, back in the day when, huh, unfortunately, it was kind of a mindset that if whatever difficulties children have, psychological difficulties children had was often related back to mothering. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, what Dr. Winnicott put out there and proposed was that um, was a little counter to that. And it wasn't, it was the idea that children don't need perfect parents. And not only do they not need perfect parents, but children actually grow from and benefit from having parents who are not perfect and, but are just good enough. Um, the idea that by allowing your child to experience some distress and allowing your children to learn how to tolerate that distress and kind of get through that distress is actually better than making sure your children have a worry free life. Mm. And so we introduced that concept to the guys in the group when um, you know, kind of back to we were speaking to earlier with the idea that that they were messing up their children by not being the perfect parent um, and by not being super dad at the same time being super mom and and really kind of this crushing sense of burden and responsibility that they can never meet. Um, and so what we told them was this whole idea of the good enough parent where not only do your children not I mean, not only is it impossible for, your, for you to be a perfect parent, but that's not what children need. They don't need perfect parents. They need parents who are emotionally available, provide some structure, discipline, and allow them to have a little bit of emotional turbulence and allow them to grow from that and are there with them to teach them and, and, and parent them. So the goal of a parent can't be to... Um, make sure your children never hurt or never have to go through any pain. And that's, you know, a lesson these men had learned in spades. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was to be present and to be good enough to be there, to be there for them, not to protect them from any kind of pain. And that, 
you know, that really set off a, a whole level of discussion with these guys about what it meant to be a good dad in the context of being an only dad. Um, and I think internally each of them had very high, sometimes maybe unreasonably high pressurized expectations. But by introducing that concept and hearing the guys talk to each other, I think we help reduce that expectation a little bit to more reasonable levels. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking that, uh, I think I mentioned him earlier, Bruce, one of the fathers, um, early in the book, we tell about how he just feels like he's the, the worst parent in the world when his, one of his, they're eating dinner with one of his daughters. Um, and he notices she has like brand new sneakers on tennis shoes. And he says, you know, where, I, you know, where'd you get those from? You're 10 years old. Had, where? And she didn't want to tell him. And then he's like, you know, where did you get these shoes from? And she says, you know, Miss Brown, her teacher at school bought them for her. And he's like, what in the, why did your teacher buy you tennis shoes? And she says, well, you know, the ones I had had a hole in them and they were, the soul of it was flopping and she heard me walking down the hallway uh-huh. with these dilapidated shoes on and Bruce, you know, said, well, why didn't you tell me? And she said, dad, I told you three times. <laughs> and he was so overwhelmed and so just kind of in the fog that it never registered. And he felt, and he said he just felt like the worst dad in the world, right? He sent his kid to school with shoes that are flopping around to the point where the teachers are pitying them and <laughs> buying her shoes. So then years later, he was supposed to pick up a different kid, a different daughter, but from school and he's got caught with meetings and just totally forgot about it. And when he checked his phone, he had an increasingly frantic list of messages from her text messages. Dad, um, when are you coming to get me? Dad, where are you? Dad, seriously, what's going on? Where are you? Dad, you know, WTF, exclamation point, and then forget it, I'm calling grandma. And so, and so he got home and said, and she gave him, you know, kind of the stink eye. And he, he said, look, I'm really sorry. I goofed. Um, I'll try not to let it happen again, but it's not the worst thing in the world. And he said three years ago, that would have crushed him mm. as a father. But at that point, you know, he, he messed up and that's okay. His kids didn't need him to be perfect. She was never in any danger. Mm-hmm. It was just an inconvenience. And he didn't have the natural inclination to kind of sabotage his own parenting self-esteem. And that was a reflection of his own growth that he shared with the guys. And um, mm-hmm. just a story. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That, that's great to hear. And it sounds like she, she became resourceful and went with plan B, called grandma, yeah. and she got Again, it right. Yeah. She, you know, he kind of dropped the ball. She had to learn to deal with some, you know, change of plans and some kind of turbulence. And she figured it out mm-hmm. and she was fine. That's awesome. So that's, yeah, that was a, a, a before and after kind of example of uh, learning that you don't have to be the perfect parent and it's, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know you guys have done some interesting research and I think you have some research continuing on as well. I was looking at, um, you had a study in 2014 um, called Overlooked and Underserved Widowed Fathers with Dependent Aged Children. And, and I was looking at this um, before we talked, and I, one of the things that struck me, I guess it really outlines why this topic is so important. I mean, from a, you know, you're coming at this from an right. academic, you know, let's figure this out research kind of perspective. But I know you say, um, if I could just read a little bit, in families with children in the home, parental death is a traumatic event. They can negatively affect the psychosocial trajectory of surviving family members and alter intrafamilial relationship dynamics. So I know you wrote that for a journal. So I'm playing Ooh, English. That sounds very that? academic, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm playing English. What, what does that mean? What's at stake here? Well, there's a lot of stake, right? I mean, this is, this is about as big of a loss as you can imagine for a family, right? Losing one of the parents. And it, it does place uh, the surviving parent and the children at risk for some negative psychosocial outcomes. There's no doubt about it. Um, it doesn't guarantee that those are going to happen, and it doesn't mean that you know, you're, you're kind of locked into it, but it does increase the risk. And what we had found was that there is just so few programs and so little research being done on widowed parents. There, there had been a little bit, and there's, there's a, a group out in Arizona who's looking at it um, as, as well, but there's, um, for such a, you know, kind of earthquake event that happens in a family. It's hard to think of one that's, that's much bigger. Um, the lack of 
research and the lack of clinical uh, attention, the lack of kind of support options that are available uh, for widowed moms and widowed dads just struck us as just ridiculous, to be honest. And um, that really kind of captured, I think we put in the title, they've been overlooked and underserved. And that that remains the case. And we're, we're doing what we can to kind of help change that a little bit. And we've, you know, created the website that we have uh, where parents can log on and look at it and hopefully watch the videos we have and look at some of the resources and at least feel like they're not alone and that there's maybe some some uh, you know some kind of tips or perspective they can gather. And then we also on that website, which is widowedparent.org, um, have a, a little tab where parents, if they're interested, um, they can click on it and fill out about a 20 to 30 minute research survey where we can learn more about the experiences of widowed moms and widowed dads. And we've, um, you know, there's really no other way to, to learn about it. You know, we have the support groups and kind of the, the focus groups in a sense, but, but for there to be real change, for there to be real, you know, hopefully nationwide program development, we're gonna need some, some data. And we have a little bit now, but we're gonna, we, we, we need more to really kind of categorize and characterize the issues that, uh, that these widowed parents face that, we hear from all the time and we feel like we have a pretty good understanding of now, but, but to get more data on that and to really kind of have a, a, a research perspective is, is going to only, we think and we hope only help, um, you know, help with the, the, the amount that these parents and have been overlooked. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's one area where our, our program's heading is to look at the research and uh, to continue to add to the website and, Ideally, we would love for these support groups to be available all over the country. Um, there's really not a great reason why they're not, uh, at least in our not so humble opinion, I guess, um, because it's not a it's not a huge lift. It doesn't, you know, we meet once a month, um, which is about all the parents say they can really fit into their schedule. Um, you know, we order pizza for the we have the kids come if they want to. We have babysitters for the kids. We order pizza. We have, you know bottled water or soda, whatever, and we just get together and we talk. It's not a heavy lift, mm-hmm. uh, but I think the current, the fathers and now the mothers who are in our separate support groups will will tell you it's been a lifesaver for them. Yeah. So the survey I think you're doing is, is really important. So I want to encourage listeners to, um, yeah, to we, I'll, put, I'll put a link on the, you know, on the show notes, but just, just to be clear, you're looking for mothers and fathers who have what criteria to answer? Yeah, that? that's a great question. So it's mothers and fathers um, who have children age 18 or younger living in the home and who have lost a partner or a spouse um, due to any type of death. Um, years ago, our focus was on, on cancer deaths because we're in a cancer hospital, but we've, we've far expanded past that. Um, the, other any- criteria, the other criteria is that um, we are looking at parents who have lost their spouse or co-parent within three years. Okay. Um, and that's somewhat of an arbitrary deadline, and it's by no means to infer that somehow after three years, uh, the, these are irrelevant, but for, uh, for kind of ways of analyzing the data, you need to have a, a little tighter sample. Mm-hmm. And so we chose to cut it off at three years. So any parent who has lost a, a spouse or a co-parent and are raising kids on their own, um, and that's happened within the last three years, can fill it out. And it's 20 or 30 minutes. Um, it's confidential. Um, and it's really, we've had, I think 530 people so far fill it out, which is great. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And the, and the more we get, the more, uh, the, the more analyses we can conduct, yeah. the more certain we can be in the, in the findings that we have. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really important. So yeah, again, I'll put the link up um, and encourage people to, to go and, and fill that out if you meet those criteria. Um, and if anybody who's listening happens to be in the Chapel Hill, North Carolina area, what kind of programs do you have locally there? We have uh, uh, we have two support groups, one for moms, one for dads, and they meet monthly um, off, not here, actually at the hospital. We had um, several parents who said they did not want to come back to the place where their loved one had been treated, which made total mm-hmm. sense. So we have it at kind of an offsite facility down the road. Um, it's once a month. There's no cost. Um, you don't have to have been treated or have your spouse doesn't have to have been treated here at UNC. Um, and the only criteria is that you have lost a, a spouse or a partner and have kids that you're raising. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it. And there's no three year criteria for that. Sure. Um, um, and that's it. And we meet once a month and you can come, and if you feel like it's something you really want to participate in, then you can you can join up. If you take a look and it's not for you, then that's fine. But mm-hmm. uh, 
but I, I, I can tell you the, the, the men and now the women who are in our groups um, find, it, um, find it really helpful to once a month get together and meet with people who can understand what you're going through in a way that other people just can't. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, I know we're reaching the end of our time today. So just one last question here. If you could say one thing to widowed parents, um, what would it be? First thing is that you're not alone. There are many, many people out there going through the same thing as you. You may not know them, but you're not alone. You do not have to be perfect. You were not perfect before your husband or wife or partner died, and you don't need to be perfect now. And give yourself some leeway. Be, be self-forgiving and be patient with yourself. Um, you're going to drop a lot of balls. You're going to sometimes feel like it's overwhelming. You're going to feel like you're not sure you can do this or you don't know how to move forward. You're going to have questions uh, abound. Um, you know, rely on your friends and family, even if they can't fully appreciate it. Um, but give yourself some space. This takes time. And there's no clock on this. There's no time limit. There's no, you know, it's been X amount of months or X amount of time. You should be, should be doing better now. Um, if you ever kind of say, I should be doing this, then, you may be being too hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's a great place to end. Um, my guest today is Dr. Justin Yap, who's a clinical psychologist at the University of North Carolina in the Cancer Center there, um, co-author of the book, The Group, Seven Widowed Fathers Reimagine Life. Um, Justin, where can listeners find you if they'd like to learn more about you and your work? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for asking. So just go to our website, widowedparent.org. And there's a kind of contact us email or a link there and you can, uh, you can email us and we'll get right back to you. And if you have any questions about the site or the survey, we'd love to answer them. If you have any kind of thoughts of wanting to maybe spur some change in your local area and get a support group going, we'd love to kind of tell you what, um, you know, kind of our experience has been. Um, you know, there's, like I said, there's no reason why these can't be available in a lot more places than Chapel Hill. Um, if you know of an existing kind of support group that's just not out there on the internet, let us know. We'd love to put it on our website. Um, and if you read the book, um, we'd love to hear what you think. We wrote it. It's certainly about seven fathers, but we didn't write it exclusively for fathers at all. Um, we think that widowed moms, widowed uh, dads, and, and hopefully those of us in the helping profession can, can get a lot from these men's stories. Okay. We, if you read it, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, fantastic. Justin, thanks so much for speaking to me today. Thanks, Jenny. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Justin Yap as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 9. And please do check out that survey that the UNC team is doing uh, at their website, widowedparent.org. And if you've been widowed by cancer, head on over to takeactionagainstcancer.org where you can download the detailed planning guide that I've created for hosting philanthro parties with your friends and family for this year's World Cancer Day on February 4th. It's a great way to turn your grief into action. Thanks to all the listeners who've been sharing their favorite episodes of the podcast on social media, and to those who've written in with questions and topics for the show. You can still write in if you'd like to at widowedparentpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.